Hey, uh, thanks very much. I appreciate everybody taking some time today. This is Mike Lewis uh, of Awareness. And today we're going to be talking about corporate trends in social media marketing. And I'm here with uh, Chris Brogan, who's the president of New Marketing Labs. Chris, are you there? I am, Mike. How are you doing? Not bad. Not bad. But before we jump into everything, I just want to give you mind just a quick update of some of the logistics that are going to go on. So first and foremost, if you have questions, I encourage you to ask as many questions as possible. Um, I apologize about this. I had some trouble. But uh, if you have any questions that come up, please use the chat function in the bottom right-hand corner of WebEx. Feel free to fire away uh, throughout the session, and we'll do our best to get to as many of the questions as possible as we're going through everything. If we don't get to any of them, we'll be sure to follow up with the after. Uh, but the other way to, to ask some questions to us is to join the conversation on Twitter. So if you're going to ask questions, if you're going to converse with anybody out, um, anybody out in, on Twitter, um, feel free to ask any questions or just chat about today's event using the hashtag Pound Awareness Inc. And we'll be sure to we'll be following that throughout the session, and we'll again try to answer as many of those questions that come through as possible. If you have any tech issues whatsoever, if you're having trouble logging in, well, if you're having trouble logging in, you probably aren't listening to me right now. But if you're having trouble logging in, if you can't figure out how to get the, the teleconference system to work, uh, please contact WebEx. We provided the information in the chat button down the bottom. It's one of the first chats that went on in the Q&A section. So feel free to, uh, to just contact WebEx directly with any issues that you may have. All right, so this is actually a pretty exciting uh, webinar. It's one that has actually taken, it's probably one of the ones, Chris, I don't know if you agree, but it's, it's taken more time to put this together just because of collecting all the data that we put together for the ebook. It really was. I mean, there was definitely a lot of information to, to gather up, and it was uh, interesting to see people's perspectives. But uh, I think the end results are kind of exciting, and I think that as people are demanding real live solid information in 09, it was uh, good to have the opportunity to contribute with you and uh, put together something useful. Yeah, I think the the interesting part is Chris and I were talking about this was we, we wanted to talk about what companies are doing in, in 2009 in terms of social media. How are they adopting it? What types of programs are they running? And we actually uncovered some really cool, interesting information I don't think either of us expected. But in order to, to figure out where we were going in 2009, we thought it was important to take a step back and figure out where we have been in 2008. So, so, so we're all on the same page so we know what happened in social media in 2008, to take a look back and see what the trends were um, leading into 2009. And there are a couple interesting things. And the first one that I'm going to talk about is around Facebook. Um, if you don't know about Facebook, then you've probably been living under a rock because they've been growing really, really fast. One of the biggest stats for the guys at Facebook is they actually upload 7 million photos per month. To me, that number was, was astounding. Chris, I don't know if you felt the same way. Huge. Absolutely giant. Huge amount of huge amount of photos, and they're actually competing now. If you think about it, with another company out there called Flickr that we'll talk about in a couple of minutes. Um, but just an amazing amount of photos, and and not only that, but they're in 170 countries worldwide, so they actually have a presence globally. And a lot of this stuff happened in 2008. They also have 150 million users participating in the site. Uh, for those of you keeping track at home, 150 million users translate to somewhere around, if you were looking at in terms of country size, that's somewhere around the fifth or sixth largest country in the world if you know, you're going to compare them to country sizes, which to me is absolutely mind-blowing. And what's really interesting is in 2008, Facebook grew 85% uh, over the course of the year, which just is an astounding growth, growth rate uh, you know, for the company. So Facebook, absolutely growing through the roof. One of the things that's really interesting and something that we're we are uh, encouraging people to use today is Twitter. So Twitter, 4.4 million unique monthly visitors come to Twitter to check out tweets, to chat with each other, to engage in, in chat. Unbelievable. Uh, 1.2 billion tweets so far. And, and Chris, what I find amazing about this number is that I think 1.1 billion tweets uh, are from you. <laughs> it's me. You know, I have to I have to at reply to all those people so that they don't gripe and say that I'm not paying any attention to them. So I'm afraid it's mostly me. Uh, that, that is pretty huge. I mean, if you think about all that we demand of that platform and the fact that, you know, just that many records of data have been written. But think one more time. Each one of those tweets goes to each user and to each user's data stream. So it's that number times every user on the platform so far. It is unbelievable. It's an absolutely huge number. And what I'm going to ask is, if people are on Twitter right now, let's have a little fun. Um, I want everybody out there, and you might have the answer to this already, but yes, how 
big do you think Twitter's gotten? What percentage growth in 2008 do you think Twitter had? So feel free to just text it in before I pull it up. It's a, it's a big number. I'll give you that one hint. Um, but if you're use – use the, use the hashtag, pound aware in a think. Let me know what you think uh, before I pull it up. See if anybody takes a guess. 500% we just got. Let's see. Uh, two, two million users. Well, here's the actual number for it. 752% growth in 2008. That's the number of people that actually signed up from the beginning of 2008 till January 2009 on Twitter. It actually grew 752% over the course of the year. By far the fastest growing of the social networks out there in terms of percent, percentage of sign-ups and percentage of growth over the course of the year. It's absolutely been going through the roof. And what we've seen more and more, and I know everybody on the phone has probably seen more and more, of this is more and more brands actually starting to take advantage of Twitter and to open accounts for themselves, which we'll talk about a little more in a minute. Another interesting part of 2008 was blog growth. This, this number is amazing to me, Chris, and I know this kind of ties into some of the work that you've done, but 95% of reporters, guys that are actually out there writing for things like the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, 95% of them actually have blogs. It's incredible. I mean, that number was not you know, from back in the whale days for Dan Floor, but it just seems like it's really uh, it's become part of a requirement of being in the mainstream of, uh, media at this point. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. And and over the course of 2008, there, and this is an estimate, some numbers go as high as 2 million, but we want to be a little conservative on it. About 1 million posts are written daily um, on blogs. 77% of web users actually read blogs. Number of new blogs created in 2008, 184 million of them. 184 new people publishing online over the course of 2008. And again, we're talking about individuals. We aren't talking about corporations yet, although some of these do um, involve, you know, corporate entities actually managing and, and building blogs. But for the most part, it's individuals and 148 million new blogs created. So let's talk about kind of the best of the rest. If you think about LinkedIn, about 30 million users on it. Flickr, which we talked about a little bit earlier, 3 billion images uploaded so far. And that's Probably a conservative number. It's probably a lot higher than, than 3 billion, but that's the, the most accurate number we could find. YouTube, about 100 million videos viewed every day. Dig, 91% growth in 2008. And of course, Wikipedia, about 59 million monthly visitors. So all this stuff is great, but it's, it's kind of like how you apply this stuff to business is really where it starts to get interesting. And for me, one of the biggest, one of the best case studies. Of, of 2008 from a social media perspective. One of the case studies you can point to and say, wow, that's, that's really amazing at how a movement, an individual, a group was able to actually capture the best of social media and use it for, for their advantage was Barack Obama. And this is a quote from a guy by the name of Joe Turpy. I don't know. Do you know Joe by any chance? Uh, it's not like we've hung out and had beers, no. But uh, I, I know him as a person. Yeah, he's a great guy. He's actually, I'm meeting him out. I'm, not, I'm in L.A. right now. And we're actually meeting him out here um, today. Um, so he's a great, great guy, really smart guy. He actually, he helped, um, he was the brains behind the Howard Dean campaign. And I know some people on the other end are probably going, uh, yeah, it's not that great. But if you think about what Joe was able to do with getting awareness online and actually, you know, bring social media into the political circles to raise funds and, and that kind of stuff, he was really amazing at it. And he said there's really only one tool, you know, maybe, really profound, one platform, one medium that allows American people to take the government back, and that's the Internet. And, of course, he was actually helping out on Barack Obama. And for those of you that didn't watch uh, or follow closely the social side, which I'm sure everybody on the line did, the social side of what went on with uh, Barack and, and all the stuff he did, about 6 million fans on Facebook, 350,000 followers on Twitter, and that resulted in over $500 million in funds raised through the web to help his campaign. You know, when I look back at 2008 and all the growth that was made uh, from a social media perspective, this is one of the case studies that stands out for me. It's one of the ones that actually, you know, really not even brought it to the, to the forefront, but proved out the model that this stuff can work and help people grow and really create a movement and take it online and, and, and push the ball forward through social media. Well, it really kind of threw a zero on the, uh, the only other really big case study from social media. You know, Gary Vaynerchuk took his business from a few million to $50 million using social media over 2008, but, you know, Barack comes and cracks him one by adding another zero on it, that making it 500 million. So, I mean, it's really vast, and I mean, there's really 
there's really a definite correlation between what uh, Barack Obama was able to accomplish and the kinds of uh, numbers he was able to reach using his web presence to the kind of dollars he was able to put in his proffer for it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, there's, yeah to me, it's just, you, you look back at it, and it's just amazing because he really pushed unbelievably how much he pushed his campaign forward using using social media. I mean, I subscribed to all his stuff just to see what the updates were, and they had him traveling all over the country and giving quotes from some of his talks, and it's just amazing um, how well they were able to tie everything together and really create a community using a whole bunch of other communities online, and that kind of leads into some of the stuff that we're going to talk about in just a little bit. Um, but this, this just to follow up the growth in 2008, this is, a, this is something that came out from Forrester, and Forrester in 2007 released the same report, and in 2008 they did a follow-up to it. What's interesting about it, if you look at the left-hand side, it's, they call it a social media ladder, and it basically defines how people interact with stuff that's going on online. So you have the creators, the people that are actually out building content, the critics, the people who are you know, contributing a lot in the comment side of everything, people who are just collecting the information, people who are joining groups, the spectators that are there, and the people who are inactive. They sign up for stuff, but they never really use it. What's interesting about this is if you look at the numbers, from 2007 to 2008, everything increased with the exception of one. That's the inactive. So even the people who are signing up and may have been passive over the years are starting to adopt social media at a much higher rate than they were before. In fact, it's from, they cut the, the number of inactives from about 44% to 25% year over year, which just shows that there's even more stuff going on in, in social media and more people actually adopting it and participating in everything. Which leads to kind of the profound point where consumers are adopting social media and how our business is adopting it. And this is where Chris and I really focused our ebook study on. So we wanted to go out and say, okay, we know we have the we have the information, we have the data that that consumers are actually out there. They're publishing. We all we all know that. I don't think anybody on the line is going to argue that people are out there interacting, they're they're uh, they're conversing online, they're using social media to connect with each other. But how are businesses using it? And what is the plan for using social media going forward? And that's really the goal. That's really what we were trying to figure out with the ebook. And so we went out. We surveyed about. Uh, we sent the survey to a bunch of people and got back about 620, 630 uh, total responses. And the way it broke down, just to kind of set everybody on the lay of the land, is we uh, we got responses from uh, about 36 percent of the people that came back were above 250 million dollars in annual revenue. Um, about 16% of them, I'm sorry, about 48% of them were between $100 million and $250 million in annual revenue, and $16 million were actually less than $100 million. There's a typo there on the slide. Uh, but we, we thought we had a pretty good uh, spectrum of the companies we were looking at, but we really wanted to get some of the bigger companies. We wanted to talk to the brands that, that, um, that you know, were spending more, that had a little bit more revenue to see what their plan is going forward. And the big thing we found, and Chris, I think you can attest this too, is that in 2009, marketing budgets are down. Oh boy, are they. Uh, it's been an interesting year to be uh, doing marketing projects of any kind, including events and or, you know, grabbing people to do social media type campaigns. But, I mean, people are being forced to be very creative with uh, what's going on. And, I, you know, I can't imagine there's anybody on the webinar going, what? You're kidding. <laughs> We're all spending double the money over here. But, uh, you know, at the same time, it's... it's through the, I mean, you know, going into this space, it's, this, is, this is an interesting year for how people are choosing to spend their dollars. Well, what's interesting about it, too, is, um, is it's, almost because, it's almost like because the economy has, has taken a dive and, and people are starting to cut back their marketing budgets, that social media has actually risen to the top of, of people's wish list, the things that they want to try to do. Because it is less expensive than some of the other channels, you know, is it cheaper to do a $3 million ad in, on, you know, during the Super Bowl or, you know, to start doing some stuff on social media? I think a lot more companies are starting to look at it more and more. I don't know if you agree with that, Chris, but... Oh, totally. I mean, $3 million for a 30-second spot. I was really convincing companies to come spend a third of that with me. That's, <laughs> that's more than a 30-second spot. But, uh, you know, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting space because... At the same time that, you know, there's external budget pressures like that, there's also a lot of regulatory pressure on the go. Uh, it's the, uh, it's definitely a, an issue where, you know, not only are businesses having to look at how they're spending, but businesses, customers, shareholders, stakeholders are all saying, make sure you spend this in a good way. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, that's what we found. And actually, when we, when we looked at the budget a little more, at, at marketing budgets a little more, what we found, oops, 
sorry, wrong way. Uh, we actually found that the one area, that, one of the big areas that they were, people were actually increasing spend in 2009 was in social. Uh, and the average was about 46.6% that people said they were actually putting money into social media. About 46.6% said video, and about 50% said they were going to increase spend in search, which I think really, 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 you know, focuses on where people, you know, focus is for, you know, 2009, that they aren't going to go out and spend a lot of money on the other stuff, but where they can and get, where they can get results, they're going to focus on it, and this is one of the areas that they, they tend to be, you know, paying a lot of attention to. So are you going to use social media in 2009? This was kind of the opening question that we asked people. And what we found is that about 50% of them absolutely said yes. 2009, we're actually going to spend you know, some of our budget in social media. There's absolutely no question. About What was interesting, I thought, was about 136 said no. And about 182 said, well, we're just not sure yet. We're not sure how, it, how it's going to shake out. Um, what's interesting about that is, is if you look at the, the two bigger pieces of the pie, the 310 and the 1, uh, 182, about 75 percent either said yes or uh, they're not 100 percent sure yet. They don't have their plan baked. And again, it's, we should remind everybody that we did this survey from about December to January, so some of the information came before people actually finalized their budgets. Um, so this could be a reason why there were some people that were saying, you know, we're not sure yet, or um, you know, why there may be, you know, an opportunity to to um, to do more social media for them. But that was kind of the thing about what we found. Just, you know, about 50% of them actually said 100% yes, we're going to do it. And we asked, well, if there's a reason why you're not going to do it, what's that reason? This became really interesting to us. This is kind of Chris and I's version of a, of, a, of a tag cloud here. The biggest reason that people were cautious about it is participation. And what they were saying was, well, if we're going to go out and we're going to do stuff on social media, how do we know we're going to get people to participate? We need to figure out if there's if there's a, you know, a guarantee that we're actually going to go out there and not make our brand look bad. And actually participation actually kind of blended into the whole brand question where people are saying, yeah, we're going to do this stuff or we want to do it, but what if no one actually comes and talks to us or participates in what it is that we're doing? That's going to make our brand look bad. It's going to make it look kind of cheesy, and we don't want to take that hit because it will impact our ROI. So a lot of this stuff is kind of tied together that a lot of brands are doing, and here's the, here's the actual breakdown of how uh, the things were scored. So... As you see at the highest level, people are saying participation and community dynamics, that's the number one caution that we have before we get into this thing. Number two is around brand image and calculating ROI, but as we started to go back out and talk to some of these people one-on-one, -on -one, those three actually combined together. They were saying, you know, yeah, we, we don't want to do the, the community dynamics side of stuff because it might impact our brand and it could give us a bad ROI, and we just want to make sure that what we're doing is tested and it's, it's you know, definitely going to work before we go out and, and get things kicked off. And Chris, you're probably finding that in a lot of companies, a lot of the companies they're working with. Absolutely. And it, it, it's funny how the, you know, it's nice to see, I should say, that the, the effort of the survey really plays out a lot to what I'm hearing out of, in the hallways. No one ever says to me, I'm worried that someone will take my good stuff. You know, they all are saying, if we build it and no one comes, we're going to feel like real jokes. So there, there's always those sort of details. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about that. I'm, I'm thinking it's, it's an opportunity where, People are looking at their concerns and, and voicing them, and then at least it gives us an opportunity to talk back to those and uh, give them opportunity. Absolutely. Now, on the flip side, we said, well, what, what is the reason that you are going to go out and do social media? Why are you actually going to get out and start doing, you know, why are you going to start running social media marketing or adding it to your marketing mix? And interestingly, the number one reason for people doing it was almost the same as the number one reason for people not doing it. It was all around promoting brand and making sure they can get customers and even par partners or prospects, whoever it is that they're, they're targeting with it, get them engaged, get them collaborating, promote us through marketing and thought leadership. This was really interesting to me because it was, it was showing that the risk on both, it was, it was both the risk but the reward on both sides of the equation. That people were worried about protecting their brand and promoting it, but at the same time, they knew that was the biggest benefit that would come from social media if they went out and actually did it. And as you can see, here's, here's the chart uh, that kind of breaks down where people were, were focused for reasons that they would go out or are going out to do social media. The biggest one being building and promoting the brand, increasing customer engagement, uh, improving collaboration, communication, and, and thought leadership and networking. Those are the biggest things. Also, marketing campaigns is in there, which really is almost the same reason why people are cautious about getting into it in the first place, which I thought was kind of interesting. It is. I, I, 
I, what I was surprised, I really kind of thought increasing customer engagement would be the number one because, I mean, if I think of social platforms in general or social media marketing in general, I think of it as mostly that. Uh, but it was interesting that that was up high. I was further interesting that thought leadership came in at four because I would have thought that things like networking, things like customer service and support would have come up higher. And uh, the only other last piece of info that I thought was interesting is that generating revenue was as high as it was. I don't know that many people are thinking of their social platforms as a revenue maker as much as a you know, way to do better retention and all that. But it's good to know that they're considering it. So I think that's the right way to uh, view forward. Yeah, there's an interesting thing that just came in on, on Twitter. Someone actually commented that, you know, and I'll quote, interesting, participation more important than ROI, brand image, and legal. Kind of hard to believe. If you think about it, and just take a step back, it really the, the ROI that people are trying to get from social media, or at least what we found what they're trying to get from social media, is actually tied into the amount of participation that people are getting. So uh, even though it looks like ROI is a completely separate thing, to me ROI is really tied into that participation metric that people are looking for. Because when we went out and started asking, you know, so participation, you really want to try to get more people involved, and how do you see that kind of playing out, they immediately went to an ROI number. They said, well, if people aren't participating, it makes my brand look bad, and it proves out that I'm not going to have a good ROI for it. So at the end of the day, it's really all about getting people participating. So I wouldn't be too... Um, <clears throat> I wouldn't draw a real hard, hard line in the sand and say participation is more important than ROI and brand image and even the legal side. It really ties in together. So the legal one definitely is something that I expected to be higher, but but I see the ROI and brand image based on the conversations we've had really tied into the whole participation metric for everything. Let's move along here. So we asked another question. We said, look, if you're out there either doing social media now, number one, if you already have programs running, or if you're planning on doing programs in the future focused on social media, would a series of best practices help? Would it be good to have kind of best practices that you could put in place and say, all right, this is how company X has, has done it. This was their success. This was their failure. Now we know how to go out and do it. And overwhelmingly, people came back. And this isn't, I mean, you know, Chris, I don't know if you agree or not, but this to me is, is kind of a no-brainer type of question. Um, if you're going to do something or something that, that feels risky, that, that you know, you've never done before, there's not really hard numbers behind it, it would always be better to have best practices supporting it, or at least that's how I run programs. I don't know if you feel the same. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. When I, you know, even, even upon asking the question, I had a sense of, well, if this one comes back overwhelmingly, no, I'm going to try <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's almost like we're asking the wrong people if it comes, uh, comes back, no, right? <laughs> But, yeah, so everybody said that they're definitely interested in, in an ROI. In fact, it's almost 100% if you include the maybes, and there's only 5% that said, absolutely not. We do not want any best practice help whatsoever. We're fine the way we're doing things, and we think we got it under control. And that really kind of, kind of leads in to something Chris and I are calling social media baby steps. And one of the things that we're going to show in the next couple of slides that we uncovered that I thought was really interesting and and Chris did as well, is that companies are basically, what we found is the companies that we surveyed, so I don't want to generalize it too big here, but the companies that we surveyed and the companies we talked to are taking what we call social media baby steps. And what we found is that basically what they've decided to do is go out and use the unpaid kind of social media to promote brand. And what that means is they're using the Facebook, the Twitter, the LinkedIn, and that is great. That's a great way to start. But what was interesting was we found the companies that had been doing that for six months or longer are actually starting to look at bigger and better ways to go out and start using social media more aggressively, building communities for themselves, um, doing more aggressive stuff on Facebook and Twitter where they're going to have to pay, you know, pay a little bit more money to get stuff going. It's almost like the people that have, have gone through it and gone through the, uh, the free side of social media, the unpaid stuff, have actually learned that, you know what, we're not getting the amount of information we'd like to have back. It's really hard to track an ROI. We need to figure out a better way to do this kind of stuff. And... Really what we said, so if you are using unpaid social media, what are, you, what are the most common ones you're using? And, again, no surprises here. This, to me, is, is exactly what we expected to see with blogs and commenting near the top, Facebook pages, uh, Facebook groups coming in second, LinkedIn for, you know, creating groups and networking, and then Twitter, um, you know, as, as kind of the fourth out of the big forum. We had other ones that people were looking at as well, but we kind of left them off the list because they were, they were so low on everything. But... It definitely is a long tail of social media as well, but these are the top four that people were looking at. <clears throat> Some examples of it. I'm sure everybody on the phone has seen a bunch of these examples, but we're going to walk through them anyway. This is, again, from a business perspective, how they use social media 
to um, to you know get a specific job or, or I don't know what the right word is for it, Chris. Maybe you can help me out. How they use social media to accomplish a specific goal. How about that? Perfect. <laughs> so JetBlue, if you aren't following JetBlue on Twitter, you really should. They're really cool, um, really cool uh, uh, tweets that they send out. It's great when you're traveling uh, to see, you know, when you know if a flight's going to get delayed or you know if you have some issues. It's also great from a customer service perspective. And I'll just share one story that happened to me a couple of weeks ago. I was actually at Logan, and they had to cancel one of the flights that I was on. It was a JetBlue flight. And someone, it wasn't me, I, I promise you, someone actually tweeted, and the minute they canceled the flight, everybody instinctively went over to the customer service desk so we could rebook on later flights. And the line was huge. It was everybody on the, that was supposed to be on the plane that got canceled. So someone tweeted in, man, the line at the JetBlue counter at Boston Logan is unbearable. I can't believe they don't have two reps on it. They, they don't have more than one rep, you know, assisting people. Honestly, God, within five minutes, three other people came over and started working in the line. And the guy was behind me that sent the tweet. And so I asked the lady when I got to the front, I, you know, did you guys get the Twitter message? And she said, yeah, actually we did. You know, someone, you know, called into the gate and said, you know, we need to send more people over because the line's too long. That's without anybody even seeing it. I mean, it would have been better if they had looked at it in the terminal and said, you know, the line's too long. We need to send a couple extra people over. But uh, the fact that Twitter actually helped, you know, relieve that, that stress on it was, was amazing, I thought. It just doesn't. It just doesn't stop at the borders of geek stuff anymore. It's just not, you know, it's stuff that's touching the real world more and more. And maybe the John Stewart show the other day is another example of, uh, you know, seeing the uh, Twitter come out into the mainstream like that. So I find it interesting, and uh, that's a great real world example. It kind of uh, beats always pulling Frank Eliasson out of the deck. Well, <laughs> well, with, with even a better story. So, so uh, I was actually at Jet Blues offices and this kind of continued. I didn't plan on telling the story, but it's kind of cool. We're at Blue's offices and we were coming in. There's a security guard that was waiting to take me and a couple other guys up to for a meeting that we had there. And we were going in to check in. You have to sign a book and all that stuff that you do at you know most offices. And he got a call that was really obviously a, uh, a customer service call. Someone was having problems with something. And here's a security guard dressed in his security uniform actually helping the woman or, or man on the other end of the phone answer the questions that he or she had and then routing him to the right to the right person. I stopped and I said, Well, that's that's amazing. I said, Do you just you know, is that part of your job to do that? He said, No, but it's a corporate um, it's a corporate mandate that we're supposed to help customers at any point and make sure that they have a good experience, you know, throughout the process. So they're actually using just like you said, Chris, it's beyond the geek stuff, it's supporting the goals of the corporation. So their goal as a company, their mission, their mantra is to make sure that everybody has a good experience on a jet booth flight or planning a JetBlue flight, or after a JetBlue flight, whatever it is, their their experience with JetBlue is supposed to be a positive one. And that filters down not just from the top or the people that are handling customer service calls, but to the guy who is the security guard at the front door, you know, signing people in that are coming for corporate meetings. So again, you know, tying it into the whole, um, you know, the whole your whole corporate strategy, I think it's totally beyond, you know, just the geeky guys, um, you know, trying to get connections on Facebook. Another cool one, another cool example is uh, Coca-Cola with uh, their fan page. It doesn't show it here, but they have well over 350,000 fans of Coca-Cola on Facebook that people can interact and talk about how great Coke is. Um, another great one, this is a shameless self-promotion. This is our, uh, if you're not a member of it, feel free to jump on LinkedIn. It's our awareness uh, uh, group inside inside, um, inside LinkedIn. And I really wanted to show a B2B example of it. There's another great one out there. Uh, which is HubSpot's um, group, and I can't think of the name of it off the top of my head, Chris, but they have a ton of people following, a lot of discussions going on. Um, can you think of the name of the – oh, I'm Is sorry, my mind's going blank. During chat? No, it's, it's marketing. Uh, oh, HubSpot's think. one? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I will know in a moment. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I can't even pull my browser up, so. I'll do that while you're talking. All right, cool. So another great example to get people engaged outside of your brand, to have people actually interact and and start sharing ideas with you know like-minded of like-minded individuals sharing ideas together. Another really cool example, and I love this one, is Bill Marriott's blog, Marriott on the Move. And what's really cool about this, this is cited in in a lot of well hospitality and retail and that kind of stuff because so Bill talks about you know how great Marriott is and where he's going and new stuff that's going on in the company. 
what actually was kind of interesting is this is an example of a company actually tying an ROI to something that they did in social media. And Bill's been attributed to this. He's talked about it a bunch of times. They actually added to the right side of, and it's down at the bottom of the page so you can't see it. And I should have captured the screenshot better. But they added a place where people could actually make reservations for Marriott. The people following him actually started to make reservations through his blog and resulted in about $4 million in, in revenue coming through this his specific blog. So they were actually able to tie an ROI number back to it. And it's often cited, so it's, it's out there that you know, he's actually talked about the amount of revenue that he's been able to do. But again, you know, it's kind of a corporate voice. You know, this is where we're going, and I want to talk to you a little bit about the, some of the inside stuff that's going on at Marriott. But another great example of a company using social media to, to spread the word and, and get the word out. The HubSpot group is called Pro Marketers. Pro Marketers, that's it. Yeah, great group on LinkedIn, and if you're not a member of it, I can't recommend it enough. Uh, they do a great job with getting discussions going and, and having people chatting back and forth and connecting with each other. So really, really, really cool. Um, really cool. So the other question we asked is, okay, if you are looking to, if you are using social media now, who are you using or who are you evaluating? And what's interesting to me is the number one here, uh, WordPress. And this kind of ties back into the starting small and then moving on to kind of the bigger social media marketing platforms like an Awareness or Jive or KickApps or Telegram or Bazinga or any of the other guys out there actually taking, you know, something simple, starting off with it like a WordPress and then upgrading to it. Because what we're finding and what we found in our survey is that people have started off small and are actually starting to think bigger with it. You know, we have a WordPress blog, but we actually want to make it more community. We want to add more features to tie back and forth, so we're looking to upgrade and so they're looking to get beyond what it was they were doing for something that's very low cost or, you know, relatively uh, inexpensive to do. Let's talk <clears throat> a little bit before we jump off about community adoption, or before we jump to the questions, I should say. Sorry about that. Uh, we actually currently have an external community, and about 60% of the people said that they did. Um, a little bit deceiving. I mean, it adds everything from a customer-facing community to partner communities to really every aspect of the community. And to drill into it more, we said, all right, well, if you are, if you have added a community or you're thinking about adding some kind of community, what would the focus of it be? What, what would you be out there looking at to, to develop some kind of social community where, where people um, engage with your brand to connect? Overwhelmingly, well, not overwhelmingly, it's pretty well distributed, but the top was a corporate voice. And I think the easiest way to think of a corporate voice, Chris, and you can jump in, but maybe, you know, that, that Bill Marriott blog is a great example of it. Well, absolutely. I mean, there's there's always an opportunity with corporate voice. There's always that attempt to try to make sure that the uh, you know it's not just speaking for the voice of the company as much as showing that there's a human underneath it all. And right. I think Bill's done that in a, in a very powerful way. And th there's you know very few other examples out there that just immediately bubble to the top. Um, you know, Sam Lawrence at Jive does a good one as a CMO. Um, as far as other good CEO or corporate blogs that. Um, Oh my goodness, uh, Jonathan from Sun. Uh, That's a great one. Yeah. Yeah, CEO. And so, I mean, there's a whole bunch of other uh, examples of that that are, but you know, uh, well, I shouldn't say a whole bunch. I say I say really good CEO blogs are few and far between, but when they are, when they are, they really hit home. And wh what we found, is, you know, based on the results we got, wasn't just that corporate voice needs to be a CEO talking. I mean, that's that's a great example of it, but it could just be a company wanting to update on new product announcements or, you know, some of the new stuff that's going on kind of behind the scenes. Sony's a great example of that. It's not the CEO, but it's a company wanting to update their community about, you know, new things that are going on, new events they're participating in, new products they have that are that are coming out soon that people might want some more information on. Um, so another great example of how people people can use kind of a corporate voice. Another so the other one's kind of falling from right to left or kind of a loyalty community for people that are really loyal to a brand and how, you know, they can engage with each other. Um, really cool thing that, I, that has come up a bunch of times or that we heard in the survey as well was around innovation. So a company that's looking to launch a new product will actually go out to their community of, it could be, you know, loyalists and say, you know, what do you think about this? You know, what's the next product we should launch? What would you like to see? How would you like to see us do things differently? Another one is around enthusiasts, user-generated content, peer support. So you know, getting people to answer each other's questions, and we're seeing a lot more of that uh, around specific events as well. So, you know, we have an event coming up. We want to make sure people can connect. So a great example would be if you're going to South by Southwest, and I'm sure a lot of people on this call are going to South by Southwest. Um, there's a great community that they built. 
we can actually log in and you can start to network with people before you go. There's even kind of a, a, a micro blog inside there that you can actually start to link up and talk to people about when you're coming in and what parties you're going to and that kind of stuff. So great example to get, you know, a community going around a specific event. And then one around associations and subscribers. And, you know, our company, uh, Awareness, we do a lot of work with companies like, you know, Constant Contact is one. So they can bring in all their customers. Uh, they can start to connect with each other and figure out better ways to, to collaborate on, on different products. And so, again, this kind of just breaks down kind of the role. And we tried to put in some examples of, custom, of, of companies that are doing stuff, you know, in each area. It, so the important thing for us, I think, when I step back and I look at the results of those things, there was a huge trend, number one, in moving from, migrating from unpaid to uh, more aggressive types of social media that, you know, require a bigger dollar investment. That was really clear in the, in the work that we did. The second thing that we found is people are really looking for more best practices. So they're looking for ways that they can go out and actually take best practices and start to implement it in what it is that they're doing. And the third way, and I know I talked about this a little earlier, the big thing that came up was also trying to find an ROI around stuff. And that's where when we start to look at, you know, reasons for doing, you know, use cases or best practices and implementing them in a company, where it really gets valuable is around the ability to have free and, you know, have metrics that make sense to that specific program that you're running that you can get ROI on that are incorporating the best practices of other companies that have already, you know, been doing doing it for a while and have either, you know, had a lot of success or, you know, have stubbed their toe along the way, but that's all incorporated in there. So you have the, we call it the features and functions that you need to get up and running quickly with a with a with a social media um, with a social media program. And and the metrics vary from, from each one. One of the things we found is that, you know, if you're looking at a peer support community, <coughs> people aren't really interested in page views, which makes sense because if you're poking around on a peer support site. If someone's poking around on a peer support site for too long, chances are it means that they can't find the answer to the question that they're trying to solve. However, on a corporate voice community, a blog like, you know, Bill Marriott, um, page views is great because these po people are, you know, looking around at different content and they're, you know, in interacting with everything that's going on. So the metrics change and so does the ROI that falls out of it. So um, that's one of the things, that's the other thing that we found that I found was really important about um, you know, the survey and the ebook that we put together. Chris, I know, is there anything else I'm, I'm missing on big learning from it? Um, no, I mean, I think that the use cases part was really great. I think that what was most interesting to me was to, to get that sort of affirmation that uh, people are a little uncertain of what they're going to do next and all that, but they do seem to be going in the same kind of direction. You know, it's sometimes you're a little worried that you know, you're out there on a limb or something like that, or that the, the mainstream hasn't followed along, but it seems that people are, you know, kind of going the same way that, you know, we would hope they'd go towards, you know, the value of making a community platform, the value of, like, understanding the difference between, you know, a community-flavored EGC platform versus just kind of throwing things to the wild. So, I don't know, it was uh, all around a, a good opportunity to learn some of that, and it was good to be able to put some numbers to what we've been feeling all along. All right, so I'm just going to jump to the end. So we're going to stop now and take some questions. I know we have a ton of questions that came in through um, through Twitter. We have a ton of questions that came in through the chat. So we're going to do our best to get through as many of those as humanly possible uh, during the next, call it 10 or 15 minutes. And if we don't get a chance to get to your question, I promise we'll, we'll follow up with an email um, ASAP to make sure that we answer any questions that you have. Uh, again, if you need to get in touch with Chris and I offline, um, the easiest way to reach Chris is probably Twitter, right, Chris? I mean, would that be the easiest? That'd probably be the easiest, to be honest. I mean, the rest of the ways are uh, you're getting a, a bit of a queue. <laughs> and that's obviously at Chris Brogan. Uh, and on Twitter, I'm Boston Mike, so feel free to drop me a note there. If you do want to get a copy of the slides, I've actually already posted them to my blog. It's blog.socialepisodes.com. Uh, we're going to have a recording available in, 24, in 48 hours, so... Those two questions, I think, were the most common that we got is, are you going to have copies of the slides, and <laughs> will this be recorded for future playback? So, um, And one last one last question, just so you know, when you do download the slides, uh, we also have a bunch of research credits in there. So when you take a look at it, you can actually go back and see not only the e-book, where we got um, some, of the, some of the metrics that we used throughout everything, but we also borrowed some stuff from Forrester. Uh, Austin's New Media Lab put a great survey together of, of 2008 social media metrics. I uh, took some stuff from chrisbrogan.com and um, a few other places that are mentioned throughout the, throughout the presentation, so you can feel free to go back. I know we've had a bunch of questions as to where you can get 
uh, the metrics for everything. Before I get into the chat, I got to say hi to Quadcat, who is dialing in from Trinidad, believe it or not, Chris. Wow. Yeah, so I just got a uh, DM from her uh, or, or him. I'm not even sure to make sure that we, uh, we say hi. So hi, and thanks for calling in from Trinidad. That's unbelievable. Um, so Chris, I'll, I'll ask you some of the questions, and then you know we can probably both jump in on the answers. But what what part? What, how do you see widgets playing in the 2009 social media marketplace? And that's the social web included in everything. Oh boy, the old widget question. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, it, it's interesting because there have been some values, and, and you know, widgets are just a, a little chunk of code that can sort of move conversations back and forth or move data back and forth between two spots. I think there's a lot of still play for the widget space. It, um, I've seen some examples. Uh, I did a panel at the end of last year uh, with uh, Sony Pictures that were using some really interesting widgets inside of Facebook. Uh, for example, they did the 30 Days of Night vampire movie, and so they took over the vampires game inside of Facebook, uh, which was good. I think that things like, um, well, I mean, here, let's look at this. The CNN inauguration, CNN.com, they used Facebook Connect. They made that go sideways alongside of uh, CNN.com, so you get that sense of mm -hmm. having a conversation with your, uh, you know, Facebook uh, audience and constituency all around talking about the uh, inauguration. Yep. In a way, that's a different kind of widget play, um, but I think that those sorts of integrations and sort of data moving back and forth things are still, there's still some relevance. Um, will they be, you know, as big a marketplace as they were in the last year? I'm not seeing any signs of that, but I could, I could quite easily be proved wrong on that one. Hmm. Yeah, that is interesting. And another question just came in that I that I think is interesting too. And this this one definitely ties more to you than me. So, how do you deal with the potential of other users spoofing you on Twitter? Oh boy, you know that's really interesting. The Guardian just had a news story about that recently too, because evidently Ewan McGregor's a little flustered that somebody's using uh, the Ewan McGregor Twitter account. Um, All right. <laughs> why is you and Fluster? No, why, no, why would you use the Ewan McGregor Twitter account? I don't know. No, I'm just uh, you know, I, everyone seems to have somebody that they want to pretend they are. Um, I think that it's a, I think it's an opportunity to, uh, you know, sort of play act a little bit. I, it, it points to the question that we've always had in, in space, in the social space, but it, it's sort of one of those, um, it's one of those ones that we use as sort of uh, scare your kids, film at 11 kind of things, too. Uh, authenticating and finding out the identities of people does take a little bit of effort. Shaquille O'Neal seems to continuously have to re, you know, re reinforce to people that he really is uh, Shaquille O'Neal. Um, and I think that what will happen is, I mean, this kind of does keep pointing towards the fact that we need some sort of a universal ID clearing system. But then with that, you've got the backfire of people wanting to have some anonymity as well. So it's one of those ones that you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. But as far as how do you actually, if you're the real person and you want to kind of block someone from, you know, using your account, there's processes in place for services like Twitter and I assume also Facebook to kind of uh, clear that up. So someone wants to know too, has anybody had any success using Yammer? Yeah, I saw that question earlier on. Um, you know, that's the kind of question I'd end up having to pass to somebody like Pistachio. Yeah, that's, uh, a great, that's a great point. You know, her group has a lot of experience in the whole micro sharing thing and I, I, I would probably just go right to... Uh, um, pistachioconsulting.com and just like, type in Yammer and see if you can find a case study there. And so, how are how are you, and, and I I have an answer too, but I'll I'll throw it to you first. So, how are nonprofit small businesses utilizing and justifying social media in two, 2009, especially given you know budget and staff constraints that are going on? How how are you seeing them adopting it? Well, uh, small small businesses and some nonprofits might not exactly be the right kind of uh, customer base for the product is drawing an awareness, which is, you know, a really robust kind of enterprise scale platform, uh, you know, that has a cost associated with it. But there's lots of free and inexpensive stuff that small businesses and nonprofits can be using. Uh, you'd want to follow somebody like Cantor, K-A-N-T-E-R, to learn about what the space of nonprofits is doing. Um, as far as small businesses, you might follow John Jance from Duct Tape Marketing, which is who's uh, Duct Tape on Twitter. Um, Small businesses are using these tools in really in inventive ways. There's lots of people doing uh, a lot of uh, personal outreach. They're doing uh, photo sharing type stuff. They're doing all kinds of uh, other opportunities to 
meet up with people on where they are. Uh, there's Facebook groups for little restaurants nowadays. So there's, there's lots of ways to try it. I guess it's a matter of uh, you know finding where your customers are and finding the best way to make a back and forth conversation. And, and actually from you know an awareness perspective, so um, you know with that bias up front, we're actually seeing a lot of a lot of traction in the in the nonprofit space this year. And part of it's because what, what we're finding is that a lot of companies or a lot of nonprofits want to figure out a way to well increase donations. Number one, I mean that's that's first and foremost, but a better way to, to to interact with the people that are you know familiar with their brand. We do a lot of work for, um, you know, I won't mention any of the names right now, but th there are a lot of different companies that we do work for and are planning on doing work for. In fact, that's the reason I'm in LA today, um, is, is working with a nonprofit. So uh, th we're definitely seeing a lot more traction in it. I think, you know, at Chris's point, I think definitely it's 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 kind of a, I don't think it's, it's generalized to nonprofits, and definitely there are some people out there that that would be better to you know ask the question specifically. Um, you know about about whether or not nonprofits are good, but we're seeing a lot of traction from our end of, of nonprofits. You know, trying to figure out better ways to engage with their engage with their um, engage with their universe of, of contributors and and you know people who donate for them. So, um, so here's a great question. Um, and though the tools aren't exactly free, I mean there's certainly a lot less money than it used to be to do knowledge management or inside you know internal collaboration and com conversation type tools. So, I mean, I think that there's a lot of opportunity for people to start using these kinds of tools uh, in a very, very uh, actionable way. So, I mean, you know, the, the fact that nonprofits are getting on board is because, it's, you know, what they had available to them before is very different. And now uh, there's just a lot more humanized tools that allow them to have better interaction. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let me just, I'm sorry, I'm just uh, catching up on one of the questions coming in. Floating through. Um, there's, here's a really good question, and, and Chris, I'll, I'll turn this one over to you as well. But have any, um, do you have any good B2B examples of companies using social media? I absolutely do. Um, I need to bring up a uh, website to do it. Um, the answer is yes, and the difference is only really in just sort of uh, what kinds of conversations they have in marketing in general. So. Um, uh, NASA was using some social media behind the firewall, um, and I got that from Pistachio's website. There's a um, there's a case about how Hewlett Packard did some, or, or Cisco, I think it was, did some internal sales processes uh, for B2B. So there's there's a little bit out there. It's it's not as often that you find a good B2B case study, but that's you know always been kind of true of marketing in general. Um, but as I as I find up some more, I'll, I'll try to pass them along. Well, another great story is actually one that I think you've shared before. It was either you or Paul uh, around the uh, the guys at IBM that were filming videos on those big. Um, oh yeah. That's there's a, so IBM. I mean, there, that, that is an example. So there's this really big giant supercomputer that uh, it takes just forever in a day to sell new things. There's like a three-year sales lead cycle. And so this guy took some really stuffy IBM videos that had been kind of cut, sort of canned videos and recut them and had a friend of his do the narrative and sort of basically made these like interesting videos out of what these cool, super cool computers can do. And it was a uh, video that these guys put up on YouTube. And uh, before anybody knew it, there was something like 47,000 views on these things. And then beyond that, uh, people started kind of complaining. Uh, the, public, the public communications group and all the professionals who basically make media for uh, IBM were saying, I don't know where these just came from, blah, blah, blah. Then they started to realize, wait a minute, this is, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of views on this product that doesn't you know, sell very fast or easy. This is actually pretty darn cool. Cisco is an example too, Mike, for B2B. So uh, there's a read write web article called How Cisco Tried to Make Routers Sexy Using Social Media. And uh, that talks a little bit about that kind of stuff as well. Oh, very cool. Very cool. Um, Going through, we have a couple more questions. If uh, this one is social media just part of, uh, t should social media be viewed as just part of the marketing mix, or is it something completely separate? Oh, my favorite. Yes, <laughs> uh, we got that last fall actually uh, with um, uh, Alan Scott from the Wall Street Journal, Dow Jones. He said that he doesn't have a separate budget for social media. He has a budget just for marketing, and then that's part of his budget for marketing. So 
he definitely played that out. And if the Dow Jones Wall Street Journal can do that, then your company probably could lay it out as well. It just social media, if you think of it as like a phone on your desk, well, marketing has a phone, IT has a phone, PR has a phone, etc. There's different applications for it, so why not just figure it into different parts of the budget stream? Uh, some of the clients I'm working with now, some of their budget is going through their customer service and operations team. Some of it's going through PR, some of it's going through marketing, because we're using those different features. So we, we decided to sort of line item it to those different places. So I think that's definitely a way that companies are both spending for it and allocating for it and or building uh, research. And, and just on that same note, Pamela just wrote in a really cool question. I've heard people to start to start uh, thinking about social media more for PR than marketing. What are your thoughts on that? You know, it's funny because I started that way. I started that with definitely the uh, opportunity. And the it goes back and forth for me because I've seen marketers do good stuff with it. I mean, I think that Richard Binghammer and Lionel Mataka and Bruce Eric Anderson and the folks at Dell did a really great job of building Twitter presence. That would be kind of considered PR style. But then they were able to flip that into adding a whole bunch of Dell bargain type Twitter feeds that have sold them millions of products on there. And that's just pure raw marketing. You know, it's, it's actually pure sales. Right. There's not even any marketing to it. Uh, so, I mean, I think it's a tool set that gets used by a lot of people. I would say it's easier for PR people to come to it, but it doesn't necessarily require that you be a PR person before you think it's a good one. And so what are what are most businesses using Twitter for? Um, are you using it for, for messages or trying to sell stuff? Or, you know, what are you seeing out there? I mean, we gave the JetBlue example earlier, and there are certainly a lot of other businesses out on know, Comcast is another one. Um, there are a bunch of them actually using Twitter. How are you seeing most companies using Twitter? Well, so it is, it, there is a blend. So, like, retailers, Whole Foods is using it to give away uh, recipes and talking back and forth and promoting a person of the day. And uh, Home Depot is, you know, kind of giving support and help out there as well from different points of view. Molson, uh, the people from Molson Beer, Molson Ferg, uh, does it both to talk about some of their responsibility campaigns and some of their cool stuff like that, as well as to point out events and mi mixers where you can go and uh, sample some interesting Molson products. Um, uh, John Andrews from Walmart is actually just sort of a regular denizen of Twitter, but he used it fairly recently when there was an ice storm in Arkansas. And Walmart, uh, if you don't know, does a lot of public relief kind of situations, not unlike what they were renowned for doing in Hurricane Katrina. Mm -hmm. And John Andrews and others helped bring a lot of resources to the storm, uh, that it, the ice storm people that had happened in Arkansas. So, I mean, there's a lot of opportunities back and forth to... Uh, uh, do different things with it. It just sort of depends how you want to do it. There's uh, everybody from the uh, American Cancer Society is on there trying to build up a, a space. Um, and uh, my friend Mark from uh, the Netherlands points out that the Netherlands Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Maxim Everhagen, uh, is also on. So, there, I mean, there's quite a hmm. spread of folks. <laughs> All right. So we're getting kind of close to the, to the hour, and I know people have got busy days and probably don't want to hear you and I converse for the rest of the afternoon, so I'm going to wrap it up with, uh, with just one last question. I think it's a really good one. It came in from Andrew. He asked, what would be the one thing corporations should do and should not do in regards to social media? That's a great question because I think we got some of the results in the survey, but I'd be interested to see just kind of off, off the top of your head what, what you think. Wow. Should do or should not do. Um, should is just remain transparent about it all. The, the one thing we don't want to see is yet another uh, YouTube scandal where it turns out that the people weren't really who they said they were or, you know, quote bloggers who end up being employees of a PR company. Just don't need it. Uh, what they shouldn't do is they shouldn't think of these as yet another channel to blast the same message down. It does require retooling, and it does require an understanding of how to drive things a, a very different way. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? One last question, Chris. i got to ask this one just because it's funny. Why is Facebook trouncing MySpace? Is it older or less tech-savvy users feel simpler to understand? Wow. Um, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll answer nicely, uh, but because I, I would say that most people's gut reaction to that would just be to say, have you seen MySpace? Right. Um, the answer is that Facebook uh, sort of kept things a little more, the, the user interface was better, there was a little bit tidier sentiment opportunity, there was a uh, a lot more interaction uh, that you can do with it than what you could normally do on MySpace. And I, I think it's just a matter of 
MySpace ended up sort of sliding into being the place that uh, bands and comics go, and Facebook ended up having sort of a, a college underpinning where uh, people could you know, at least have a slightly better feeling of, uh, I don't know, sophistication or something. So are you knocking stand-up comics? Is that what you're saying? Hell no. Stand-up comics are awesome. <laughs> How do you feel? <laughs> well, for everybody listening, it's, I do that for fun every few weeks, do stand-up comedy. So I'll, I'll let everybody know about my next one so Chris can come and make fun of me. Um, <laughs> One last thing, I, I know I keep saying this is the last one, but this is actually a good one, and I think it just really ties into the research. Uh, Anna Ann asks, do you recommend companies wanting to get into into social media who want to get into social media start with listening first? And I think the answer is yes, and I think that's exactly how companies are starting to do it. And that's kind of what the research pointed to is that companies are actually going out doing stuff on Facebook, Twitter, you know, MySpace, LinkedIn, YouTube. Um, all these different channels as a way to kind of figure out what's going on before they take a deeper dive into social media. And that's definitely what we found, is that through 2008, the companies that had been, I don't want to say early adopters, because, you know, certainly people have been blogging and companies have been putting blogs out for quite some time, but people that were testing out the social media waters on some of the uh, some of the social web um, are actually taking the next step up. And you know, some of the reasons that we found, and I can get into a little bit more of this if you, know, you guys want to ask me offline, but some of the, the one-to-one interviews that we had is people saying things like, you know, on Facebook we just didn't have access to the data and we really wanted to have that data to really influence our offline program. So, you know, we want to figure out who all the members are of our groups and be able to profile them and then say, all right, based on that, you know, we've realized that, you know, 75% of the people that are fans of our brand also watch Lost on Thursday nights, so we should, we should you know, run some ads on Lost or something like that. So we're finding people are using it to listen initially and then taking a much deeper dive in it um, after they've kind of gotten their feet wet and are up and running with it. And Chris, I'm sure you're seeing the same thing, you know, not just from the from the report, but just out in the field with the people you're working with. I'm just looking to see if there's anyone that just came up. Uh, here's one for you, Chris. One last one. I promise this is the last, and then we'll jump off. <laughs> Do you recommend a good way or resource to justify ROI or reach of social media? Uh, so I answered uh, the very first thought that came right to mind was to pick up the book Groundswell by Burnoff and Lee. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's easier because there's some neat little things inside there. Um, the same kinds of people who do answers on reach or resource, um, you know, it, 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 there's a, it's difficult because you need to calculate the ROI very specifically to the organization. And right. it's not just a slam dunk. To, uh, there's not, it's not just an easy slam dunk to do that. So I would say that um, it, it sort of depends per organization. And then further, I guess I would say that it's an opportunity where you have to, um, you know, look look for the exact needle that you're going to move. Mm-hmm. That's a great point too. I think you know I would have said the same thing. I think that it, it's not, and it's almost beyond organization. It can be organizational, but it can also be just the goal of what it is they're trying to do on social media, which usually ties into the organization. So someone like Jeff Blue. You know, their definition of ROI would be very different uh, because they're focusing on, you know, how do we improve the customer experience through by using social media to do that, and that's, you know, kind of the way they've gone about it. To so someone like a Bill Marriott who's saying, look, I just want to get people to come to my hotel, so I'm going to track sign-ups through my blog, and, you know, I got $4 million last year, which is great, and we got to figure out a way to improve on that from an ROI perspective. Um, so I think it also depends on what the goal of the whole program is. And that's Groundswell's exactly. a great, you know, Groundswell's a great book for that, too. I mean, they talk a lot about, um, net promoter score and um, you know other really cool metrics that you can use to to get a really good ROI uh, from your social media marketing. Right, and I mean that's it's exactly where I was leading towards is the fact that one of my clients, the goal of the whole process was just to reduce the distance between somebody griping about something and somebody getting back to them. So it's right. a basic customer service thing of reduce this number from this many minutes to this many minutes, and. Another one was something totally different. We want to have this many new inbound links uh, because we think that will help us in our Google rankings. It will help us sort of, you know, be more aware out there in the space. And, that, you know, that's, that's almost like plain old search engine optimization or search engine marketing. So, I mean, it, it's sort of a question of, you know, what the, what the next hop is on your request to what the ROI is, and then you can make the calculations there a little deeper. There's a million, billion blog posts with kind of creative ways to show off the ROI, and that's partly because, we just all haven't really decided on a set standard because it's a tool set, not, you know, it doesn't replace TV. It doesn't replace newspaper. It doesn't replace any one thing. It replaces a whole, or it augments a whole series of other things. So it's just not, 
it's just not a good, easy, cut and dry answer, which is why we all seem to stutter when it comes down to talking about the numbers. Well, on on the stuttering point, I'm going to say thanks to everybody on the line. Uh, thanks definitely for to you, Chris, for number one help. You know, working so closely with me, I'm I'm putting that ebook together. It was phenomenal. It was uh, it was a huge learning experience for me. So I, I had a lot of fun pulling everything together and, and working with you on it. But thanks so much for taking time today. I know you're busy with a million other things going on uh, to be on the call and, and to participate with everybody. Mike, thank you. It was a really great project, and I'm really glad for all your work on it. And uh, thanks so much for uh, letting me be part of it. And everybody on the line, thanks again. We appreciate it. We're going to take a look at all the questions that came in that we didn't have a chance to answer and, and hopefully get back to you in the next couple of days and, and provide some sort of answer um, you know, for you. And again,